Today I am updating and adding to a previous episode I did about the Social Security Death Index. Also known as the SSDI, this is a valuable set of records. It is often one of the first places we go as genealogists when researching our family history. In this episode, I am clipping parts of the previous episode about the Social Security Death Index and to share some new tips that I've discovered about the Social Security applications and the original SS5 form and how to get the most out of it. All right, there's more to these records than meets the eye, so stick around. Okay, so we're here today. We're gonna to talk about the Social Security Death Index. And if you're new to genealogy, you definitely wanna be aware of the Social Security Death Index. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of run through an exercise with my great grandmother here, Francisca Emily Cornelia Jensen, who later became Francis Johnson, who then married, become Francis Madsen. When she died, she was Francis Madsen. So we're gonna do a little research using the Social Security Death Index. Just so you'll know, the Social Security Death Index Index is wildly helpful to help make connections either between children and parents or sometimes it gives you more information about where they were born etc you'll learn more here in just a moment what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump over to ancestry's card catalog just for the sake of demonstration purpose to give you some quick background what I'm talking about here is when you go to the card catalog at ancestry and you can research some of this on some of the other services but i'm showing you on ancestry because they have both sets of records here so here we have the social security applications and claims index 1936 to 2007 and the social security death index 1935 to 2014. So the Social Security Death Index was actually established in 1962. So as you can see, some of the records go back to as early as 1936 in one case and 1935 in another. It really wasn't established until 1962. The difference between the two sets of records is this is one that was established first, the Social Security Death Index. Later on, the Social Security Applications and Claims Index came along, it kind of takes off where the other leaves off. So it has more information. It has information uh, specifically about their full name, social security number, the date and place of birth, citizenship information, the sex, the father's name, the mother's maiden name, and sometimes race and ethnic description. So this other set of records is really a good set of records to also be looking at. Now, in my case, when I am looking at my great grandmother here, Frances, we're gonna do some research on her and I'm gonna show you how we do that on Ancestry. But take note that she was born in 1880 in Denmark and she died in 1972. That's really all we need to do this research other than her name as known at death was Francis Madsen. So we're gonna do some research on that here in just a moment. Do know that you can get to the Social Security Death Index on Family Search for free. Okay, so you do not have to have a subscription to Ancestry. What you do is you go to the search uh, tab at the top and you go to card catalog. And all you have to do is go into the keyword and hit SSDI. Or Social Security Death Index and hit return and these are the two record sets that you come up with. Now I suggest that you search both sets of records but I usually start with the Social Security Death Index records first and I'm going to type Francis Madsen. Now remember she was born in 1880 and she died in 1972. I have one record that shows up. She was in Long Beach. I know this is correct. So if I view the record, this is the information I get. Now we're gonna take note of the last four digits of this social security number, which is 3261, okay? It says she was born in 1880. The date of issue was 1966 in California. That's when she got her social security number. Her last residence was in Long Beach and the date of death was 1972. So at this point, I would want to save it to someone in my tree. And I'm gonna type Francisca because it didn't pop up with Francis because Francis Madsen was really an alternate name. Francisca, I think it is. There she is. I'm gonna attach it. And now it's given me the opportunity to save this information to my tree. Now we're gonna go back to the card catalog and pick up that other record. And we're back to this set of records. Now we just found her in this set. Now we're gonna look for her in this set. And again, we're gonna type Francis Madsen. And she was born in 1880 in Denmark and she died in 1972 and that's all I need search and there she is now notice 
that the spelling of the name is kind of goofy. That's because it started to put out her mi her maiden name of Johnson. This is where I had corrected it, these brackets. I had corrected it a while back, but her father's name is now listed here as Lawrence Johnson. His mother's name is Christine Beck. And if you'll notice the last four digits of the social security number is 3261 that matches the other record that we found. So I'm going to save this one again to someone in my tree, Francisca. I'm going to attach it. Okay, so now that I have saved that information to the tree, you'll see it in the sources here as I scroll all the way down. You see that the Social Security Applications and Claims Index is here and the Social Security Death Index is here. One of the things that I wanted to show you about this was if you go back to the original search window for the Social Security Applications and Claims Index, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can learn a little bit more about it, but also, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, now that we have her information, there is a link here to request more information. So if you want to get more information from the Social Security Administration from that index, right? It's just an index. It's not all the information. You can do that by going over here to the online request form. There is a link right here at Ancestry and you can click through to that. It takes you over to the Social Security Office website. You have to, at the very top of the screen, request the form, fill it out, pay a fee, and hopefully you'll get some more information about your ancestors. When you are researching in general anytime you're researching you always want to dig to the original source and that's what we're doing here by clicking through that link on ancestry to get to this page that you see here this is the freedom of information act page this is where you that link takes you to start your request you click on create a request and hit begin and go through the process there my whole point here is that you always want to dig for the final uh, original information you want to get as close to the source as you can and not just an index online all right so here's some additional strategies and tips know that the laws prohibit us from seeing the last three years and well i briefly mentioned that i was sending off for the ss5 form for my uh, grandmother and we're going to jump over to the computer now and take a look at that. Okay, we're going to get more into how to apply for the SS5 because there's a couple little nuances about it after having done it myself. And I'm going to share that with you here in a few minutes. But I wanted to point out a couple more things about the online indexes. And here we're looking at the uh, Social Security Death Index for Francis Madsen, who we talked about in the previous clip. And a couple things that I wanted to point out was take a look at the last residence. So I had a viewer write in from the last episode and Gail wrote, and this is a great tip, so I'm sharing it with you. So Gail wrote and she gave us some great advice about the last residence. So let's take a look. She wrote, just a heads up on the death location on the SSDI. The last address can sometimes be the address of a person requesting the final death benefit. For example, my grandfather died in a retirement community in Mesa, Arizona, but his SSDI last address says Finley, Ohio, which is where my eldest uncle lives as he handled the estate. Likewise, my father died in a veterans administration hospital next in the next state over from us, and she said, but the SSDI says Findlay, Ohio, which was his home address, but he hadn't lived there for 10 years and didn't die there. Don't automatically dismiss the potential ancestors because the address doesn't make sense. And don't assume that the address is where they actually died. He could still be your ancestor. So great point. And thank you, Gail, for that tip, because that could be a make it or break it for some people. Okay, the next thing I want to point out is when you are looking looking at the either the SSDI or the uh, Social Security Claims Index, you both both of those views on Ancestry, you'll get this side suggested box. Take a look at it because you, it could automatically link you right to the other records. And another big point I want to make is a lot of these states had their own death index. As you can see down here, the California death index also has Francis Madsen there. So make sure you're paying attention to that suggestion box. So another point to make here, and I'll continue with Francis here as my example, make sure that you go over to Family Search because Family Search has a little bit different information. Here they're giving us her age 
and her birth date and her death date in full. Over, if we go back over to Ancestry, we get a lot of the same information, but in this case, normally you would get a mother and father. I don't have that for her here, but let's move on. I'll get back to that in a minute. Over here at the Social Security Death Index, we get a little bit different information. And don't forget the California Death Index also gives us information. And oh, by the way, side note, before you go and order a death certificate, certificate or a birth certificate or any vital cer certificate, make sure you check on family search before you do because a lot of times that information is available over there for free. Okay, so let me show you all of this data compared. Look at what we have here. We've got name across the board. We've got social security number on ancestry. We have birth dates uh, across the board here. We have the year of issue on Ancestry. We have the state of issue on Ancestry. We have the last residence on Ancestry and Family Search. We have the death date across the board. The California Death Index has a slightly different date, which is a conflict we would need to resolve, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, we have gender on the uh, claims application and the California Death Index. We have birthplace only on the Social Security claims and applications on Ancestry, and we have a claim date here which is 1966. So that brings me to another point. That pins where she was living in California, right? We got California up here and we got 1966 here. So we at least know where she was on this date because that's where she filled out the application. Now, in my case, we don't have the mother and father and actually that would be under the claims uh, application, but stick around because you're gonna learn a little bit more about why you write for the uh, SS5. And now in the Cal we have a death place and we have California uh, information over here on the SSDI and family search. So, you know, and even the age at family search and let's not forget at family search in the California death records, they give us a death certificate number. So collectively, we have a lot of data that we didn't have before. Another couple points I wanted to make. Here we are looking at Sally Knox. This is the application and claims index. And here you can see that her parents are listed. In fact, they've got hyperlinks so that you could drill through and see more information about the parents. In this case, it doesn't really tell us anymore when I drill through. But I do want to note that there is additional information about her name down here as to when her name changed and when it was noted in her file. It doesn't necessarily Necessarily mean that the name change that the dates on these name changes is exactly when she changed her name but that's when it was noted in the file now let's jump back over to Francis Matz and this is the Social Security death index as opposed to the application you can request a copy of her original application right from here we're gonna show you how to do that I did that for Francis and I have a copy of it right here. I'm gonna show it to you in just a moment, but let me show you how you would apply. So when you drill through, you get to this page for the Freedom of Information Act and you can create a request. Now I showed you earlier about this page, but what I didn't show you, you wanna click on create a request and hit the begin button. And when you do, you're gonna select your agency, Social Security Administration, and you're gonna read through this information. You're gonna fill out this information. This is your contact information, not the person person who you are requesting information for. But one of the things that you want to pay attention to is the request type and fee. So when you click the down arrow, you want to choose the original application. Now there is a computer extract, but you want the original application. It's going to give you the form that she actually filled out and her signature. So you would fill all this information in and then submit it. Now for me, during the pandemic, it took quite a while to get this back. It took several months actually. Let me show you now what's on here. In this particular case, there is not any great deal of information on here except that it does show her parents as Lawrence Johnson and Christina Beck. So there is some great genealogical information here. Now the problem with this document that I got from Francis is that it is a computer generated. It is not the original form. They sent me a nice little letter and it says basically what they've enclosed is the only document available. So in, in the case of Frances, uh, her original form was not available, only this uh, document that is in print. 
So now let's take a look at some of the other documents that some of the viewers from Genealogy TV sent in to help me out because I needed a good SS5. And you can see that there's a lot more uh, detail here. Here we get his full name, address at the time he made this application on December 2nd, 1936. We have his age and his last birthday. We have birth date. We have his birthplace. We have his parents' names in full. In this case, nice, neat printing. His gender and he's white and he's never filled out this application before. We even get employment information as well as the address of his employer. This document really provides us a lot that we might not have gotten in the index. Thank you Kathleen for sharing your document. Thank you Crystal for sending in this document. One of the things I wanted to point out here was on these SS5 documents when you get the original you have the original signature of your ancestor. You want to hang on to those signatures so that you can help verify other documents. I have one more example I want to show you that uh, Mary Jane sent in for me to use. Connie, here's my grandfather's SS5. It is the only document I have stating his place of birth. Since he was born before vital records were kept officially at the state level, I've used this document in lieu of a birth certificate. All right, all of that to tell you to order the SS5. In my case, uh, the father and mother was not listed. I managed to get a copy of her document, even though it's a difficult one to read and doesn't have a ton of information, it gives me that next generation. As a reminder, there is a handout for this episode for the information access level channel members. If you're not a channel member, all you have to do is click the join button at the bottom of the screen so that you can learn a little bit more about how to become a channel member. All right, there are more videos on the screen for you now uh, for your binge watching consideration. Until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.